every leaf, each branch. Huh? Or you can just water the root of the tree, and then you automatically water the whole tree. Huh? So we can try to serve or do something nice for each and every living entity. And that's, that's a beginning. But it's much more efficient and much more effective to serve the root, the origin of all living entities, and that's Krishna. Krishna means the Supreme Personality of Godhead, uh, the source of all. Krishna, the word Krishna means the source of all pleasure, the reservoir of all pleasure, the origin of all enjoyable things. So when we chant Krishna, we are invoking the complete whole, the original source, the root of all existence, the supreme controller, uh, the source of all energies, the creator, the knower, the doer. Uh, our original and only real eternal friend. Now that's Krishna. So then, when we try to help others also know Krishna, we do the best welfare work, the best relief work, uh, the best karma. Uh, at that point, it's actually beyond karma. Uh, it's transcendental knowledge. To give transcendental knowledge to others is the best welfare activity because this knowledge is the cure for all suffering. It's the solution to all problems. It's the best knowledge because it leads to the cessation of material suffering, the cessation of material ignorance, the cessation of material existence. Huh? We're all going to die anyway. So we might as well leave the body in such a way that in the next body, we're in the spiritual world, in the transcendental world. That's where Krishna is. Uh, sometimes he comes to this material world, but most of the time he's not found here. It's only very rare uh, periods that he comes. The last time was 500 years ago. He came as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And there are many different saints, and there are many different scriptures in the world there are many different religions, many different spiritual paths. But if you do a comparative study, you will not find any teaching that can match the uh, teaching of Krishna. This esoteric teaching is actually the teaching of Krishna. Uh, he gave this teaching 5,000 years ago, and it was written down as the Vedas. The Vedas are the world's oldest spiritual literature, the world's oldest spiritual culture, and the oldest living culture in the world. Every other ancient culture has been destroyed. Only the Vedic culture goes back with a clear, continuous lineage more than 5,000 years. So if you want to know what the ancients knew, if you want to know uh, the process, that leads to the cessation of all misery, solution of all problems. Because uh, all problems have to do with this material body. There isn't a single problem you can name that is not associated with and, or finds its cause from this material body. All problems are here in this material world. If you leave this material world and you go to the spiritual world, the world of pure consciousness, there are no problems. There's no scarcity. There's no ignorance. Uh, there's no difficulties. There's no birth or death or sickness or old age or any of those things. Those are only in the material world because of the material body. So why would you want to stay in a place where there's so many problems when you could easily transfer your existence to a place where you're already at home, the spiritual world? Uh, you're already a spiritual being. But because you're trapped in this body and you identify with this body, you think you are this body, 
therefore you are affected by all the problems that affect this body. So the beginning of transcendental knowledge is to know that I am not this body, I'm not this mind, I'm not this name, I'm not this form, I'm not this uh, designation, whatever material designation I may have. But I am an eternal being of pure consciousness, like unto God himself. The only difference is I am tiny, atomic, and God is unlimited, oceanic. So once we know this and then we begin to act on this knowledge, we advance in spiritual life. And we eventually get to the point where we realize our actual spiritual existence. Not just as knowledge, not just as a theory, not just as a philosophy, not just as a spiritual practice, but as our actual native consciousness. And when that happens, we attain self-realization. That is the aim of spiritual life. Uh, that's actually the aim of human life. So when we attain, uh, then at that time, we're fully cured from the disease. And we can uh, get out of the hospital. Uh, <laughs> the doctor clear, will clear us for, uh, uh, to go home back to our original existence, back to the spiritual world. And that's the purpose of this esoteric teaching. That's what we're doing here. That's why we're here. That's why we hold these meetings. That's why we study all these ancient books, chant all these mantras, do all this stuff. It's a science. It's quite an elaborate science. And um, in our other classes, we go quite deeply into the complexities of this science because in the West we don't know much about consciousness. Consciousness is very, very complex. Uh, consciousness is much more complex. The world of consciousness is much more complex than the world of matter. There are more varieties of phenomena, and more varieties of experience in the spiritual world than there are in the material world uh, because the spiritual world is the origin of the material world. The material world is a subset of the experiences that one can have in the spiritual world. Well, that's the way it has to be. So just like the soul is limited or finite and the Lord is unlimited, uh, the, the material world is temporary and the spiritual world is eternal. Uh, Krishna says, never was there a time when you, nor I, nor all these kings uh, did not exist. And never in the future shall we cease to be. The soul is eternal, immortal, and primeval. He does not die when the body is killed. No one can destroy the imperishable soul. Uh, it cannot be hurt by weapons, cut by uh, a knife, withered by the wind, dried by the sun, burned by fire. Uh, there's nothing that can affect the eternal soul. The only way the soul can become diseased is by our own will. If we try to do something that is uh, dangerous for us, uh, we can become covered by ignorance because of the reaction. So in this material world, there are so many sinful things. Anytime we cause pain to another or anytime we pollute our senses, then we perform sinful activities. Uh, so there's so many sinful activities, meat eating, intoxication, illicit sex, gambling, speculation. Uh, and uh, of course, these things are rampant in the world. So as monks, as uh, spiritual people, we withdraw from these activities and instead we cultivate spiritual activities. Uh, we chant the holy name, we eat food, vegetarian food offered to the Lord, we uh, uh, meditate 
on his pastimes and his qualities. We understand this philosophy and we serve him. And the main service that we do is that we help other people to understand this philosophy. Oh. It's not like we're mindless um, fundamentalists trying to grow our little cult. <laughs> Actually, we turn away a lot of people. Somebody wrote me yesterday and they said, well, um, I want to I want to come down there and join your school. I want to take all your courses and I want to do this and I want to do that. And their name was so and so Das. And I said, well, where'd you get that name? So and so Das. And he said, oh, well, I'm a member of ISKCON and da 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 da. And I said, I'm sorry, we have a policy. We do not accept members of ISKCON. And he wrote back, I'm shocked.